Olecranon fractures, a case-based approach to understanding management. This is from the OTA Core Curriculum Resident Lecture Series Version 5. Slides are by Dr. Jonathan Gross, and I'm Saqib Rahman narrating. So this is going to be somewhat case-based. Uh, the objectives are to review pertinent bone and soft tissue anatomy, to understand fracture patterns and associated instability. We're going to talk about indications, strategies to stabilize fractures and restore stability, and go through some pearls to minimize risks of surgical complication and illustrate key points of management. And uh, this will be broken up into two videos. In this one, we'll talk about the anatomy. We'll talk about a little bit of classification. Uh, we'll talk about uh, management um, with uh, tension band wire techniques. Uh, and then in the next video, we'll continue to talk about management, uh, focus on complex injuries, uh, plate and screw fixation techniques, and uh, outcomes. So when you think about the elbow, there are three distinct joints, right? There's the ulnar humeral joint, right? There's the uh, radial capitellar joint, and then there's the proximal radial ulnar joint, right? So you have three bones, there's three joints. So the um, first you have to think about bony anatomy when you're thinking about elbow stability, right? So there's normal, normal muscle forces drive the elbow posteriorly, uh, there are bony restraints that resist this. So the coronoid process helps to resist posterior um, dislocation to some extent, as well as the radial head. And these muscle forces, and we're going to, a lot of these slides, you're going to see some correlation between the uh, colored arrows and the colored uh, you know, illustrations on the right and then the text on the left here. So you can see the muscle forces also help to uh, provide stability. Um, so varus and valgus stability also has some bony uh, restraints, the radial head, the trochlea, the medial coronoid facet, uh, as shown here. There are also ligamentous structures responsible for static stability. So on the lateral side of the elbow, you have the lateral ulnar collateral ligament, as shown here. Uh, medially, you have the anterior band of the MCL. And then anteriorly, there are capsular tissues that also provide stability. So you can see multiple views here demonstrating the ligamentous restraints. So the uh, articular cartilage you know, at this, it, it is you know, in, in the olecranon. Um, a couple of things to keep in mind. The sigmoid notch of the ulna is a bare spot centrally between the tip of the olecranon um, and the coronoid, it's kind of demonstrated there. Uh, so beware of narrowing sigmoid fossa when treating common neutral olecranon fractures. You want to make sure you don't narrow that um, and like kind of shorten the normal articular surface. Uh, the coronoid process, you want to make sure you preserve height. So it should be about roughly two times the olecranon height, and um, you can kind of get a, a sense of that here. And the tip of the olecranon, or tip of the coronoid, excuse me, uh, to the tip of the olecranon subtends an angle of about 30 degrees from the long axis of the ulnar shaft. So if you understand the normal anatomy, you can hopefully better understand when there's pathology or what you need to restore to. So the olecranon process, um, you know, there's about, if you look at this angle drawn along the dorsal cortex of the ulna, you can see there's about four degrees dorsal angulation of the proximal ulna with the rest of the ulna shaft. If you look at the AP view, you will see that the ulna has about 12 degrees of varus angulation as well. So it's not perfectly straight um, when you go from the uh, proximal ulna to the shaft on either view. You also have to keep in mind that the articular surface extends beyond just that, you know, it's not just this sort of perfectly, you know, flat surface and that joint space where, you know, those screws there could potentially be intraarticular. And this is a sort of cadaveric demonstration of screw placement showing that, in fact, those can be intraarticular. So you do have to be very cautious um, 
of where your articular surface is, and it really can be uh, extending all the way into the territory shown in red here. So let's talk more about olecranon fractures themselves. So they occur from a variety of mechanisms. It can be an acute tension overload. So tension applied by the triceps with flexion of the elbow, direct trauma onto the olecranon itself, uh, or potentially chronic overload, like a stress fracture seen in osteopenic patients. So when evaluating these, you wanna check the integrity of the skin you want to check extension of the elbow. So can they extend uh, or not? Right? Is their extensor mechanism disrupted or not? Uh, can you put their arm over, you know, forearm over their head and can they extend against gravity or not? Now, if you have a highly comminuted displaced fracture, you may not need to check for this. Um, but uh, in sort of those in-between cases, this is something you may need to check. Um, evaluate neurovascular status, the ulnar nerve in particular. You want to make sure you get good radiographs, so the AP, lateral, and sometimes an you know, oblique view can be helpful if you're also needing to um, get the sort of radial head into a better profile view to make sure there are no radial head fractures. There are many classifications, um, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about classification here. Um, these are some of the criteria to keep in mind to so the Mayo classification. Uh, is sort of like this, type 1, type 2, type 3, uh, and then types 2 and 3 are subdivided as well. Won't focus too much on classification, but we're going to talk a little bit more about you know, treatment. So the goals are you want to restore elbow motion and prevent stiffness. And you want to, with elbow injuries in general, you want to be able to get to early range of motion to prevent stiffness. So uh, restoration and preservation of the elbow extensor mechanism is critical with olecranon fractures, right? I mean, so you have essentially loss of the extensor function in displaced injuries, and um, that is a function you want to be able to preserve for a patient like you would with a displaced patella fracture, for example. Uh, you also want to restore the articular surface. I mean, this is an articular fracture, so, um, you know, AO principles of... Uh, uh, anatomic uh, restoration of the articular surface apply here, and you want to prevent complications. So uh, you can sometimes treat these non-surgically in low-demand patients if they have a stable joint, meaning they're not subluxing or dislocating, but in many displaced fractures, you're going to need to do open reduction internal fixation, although there's also a role uh, for excision if you have maybe an elderly patient who's got you know, who's lost active elbow extension, and it's maybe a comminuted, unreconstructable fracture. Um, certainly is appropriate for non-displaced fractures, although you don't want to immobilize them for too long. So you may want to provide a short duration of immobilization and then allow for some early motion. Indications for surgery is if you have disruption of the extensor mechanism. So again, you bring their forearm perhaps above their head, and can they ex actively extend the elbow against gravity or not? Uh, and of course, articular congruity is a, is a problem too. If you have four or five millimeters of displacement at the articular surface or step off, you know, that is something that uh, would warrant uh, reduction to restore congruity. Let's look at an example. Here's an elderly woman, moderate demand, multiple medical problems, falls, comes in with this, can't extend the elbow. So what do you have? You have a comminuted fracture here. There's a large displaced fragment, but you'll look closely. There are some additional fragments as well. So what are your options? We talked about some as already. Um, in fact, you know, and she can't extend the elbow. So um, we decide, you know, something does need to be done surgically. When you get in there, that fragment's actually smaller than it looked maybe on x-ray. Uh, there's some comminution here. There's an oblique fracture in the frontal plane, some comminution at the sigmoid notch. So what are you going to do? Well, you can consider olecranon excision and triceps advancement. It's an elderly patient. Um, you need to restore elbow um, extension, and the fr fracture itself may be somewhat hard to reconstruct. So this is an option. You get a functional result. The patient's able to range and use the elbow and to actively extend without pain. So 
If you have an elderly patient with osteoporosis and you have less than 50% of the joint, you can reattach the triceps. Now, when you do it, you got to do it anteriorly. So here you can see uh, in, this, in this example here, the uh, triceps is reinserted at its close to a normal position. That's actually incorrect, right? So what you want to do is you want to reinsert the triceps closer to the articular surface. Um, so that is, if you're going to do this, that's how you would want to accomplish your um, repair. Uh, so the pearl is to advance that tendon anteriorly adjacent to the distal humeral articular surface. Now, um, how do we approach these? We kind of skipped over that. So um, you're going to do a posterior approach. Uh, usually you can be supine. You could also be lateral or prone. Um, but uh, you can certainly do these supine, bring the arm across the chest. You can use a tourniquet, although you do have to be careful. It does not uh, get into your field, and it also could tighten the extensor mechanism, regional general anesthesia. What about fixation? So once you get your reduction, uh, fixation can be done with tension band wires for simple transverse non-comminuted fractures. I'm not going to go too much into the concepts of tension banding. This is a this is an AO principle in which you convert tension to compression forces, and it's done classically in areas such as the olecranon, also the patella. You can use an 18 or 20 gauge steel wire or possibly a, a small caliber braided cable. Uh, the, you have to make sure the wires cross over the dorsal cortex. There's a lot of technique involved to do this properly. Uh, but it's otherwise fairly simple technique. Um, you want to use parallel K wires. You could also use an intramedullary screw. So let's go through some, uh, go through some technique pearls. Um, so uh, you want to reduce the fracture, maybe with a tenaculum. Um, you could also extend the elbow to bring the electron onto the shaft. So that'll get you in the ballpark, and then you can use your tenaculum to compress the fracture and hold it reduced. Okay, so then next step is you're going to place K-wires across the fracture. If possible, you can engage the anterior cortex. Um, so you can use provisional K-wires, um, arm extension, or clamp to hold it when you're, uh, as you're you know, then placing your definitive K-wires. So here's your two K-wires. Now these can be placed to engage the anterior cortex, but you have to make sure they don't, if you're going to do this, that they don't, um, extend too far beyond the anterior cortex because you can injure the anterior interosseous nerve. Uh, alternatively, you can also place the pins more perpendicular to the fracture. And then here's your triceps mechanism. You're going to pass a tension wire deep to the tendon, right? And this can be done by placing an angiocalf, and then you pass the wire through the angiocalf. Uh, and then when you place your um, figure of eight wire, you want to make it in two balanced twists over the dorsal cortex, one radial and one ulnar, uh, as shown here. So here's a patient, 25-year-old, falls off a bicycle, uh, cannot extend the elbow. You can see a displaced olecranon fracture. What's the orientation? So take a look at that. So it's relatively simple transverse fracture pattern. So this is a case that's amenable to tension band wiring, as we showed. And here you can see essentially execution of what we had shown in the cartoon video previously. So uh, relatively simple transverse. Maybe it's a bit oblique, uh, but uh, this is something amenable to tension band wiring uh, in most cases. Notice that the pins are directed ulnarly away from the proximal radial ulnar joint. So you do have to be careful. Um, sometimes, uh, if, if you're not careful, these these pins that you place can be something like this, and then this pin here could uh, block motion at the proximal radial ulnar joint. So you always have to check pronation and supination, and get a good AP view to make sure where those pins are going. Here you can see they've engaged the anterior cortex. So, as I mentioned earlier, if the K wires project. Um, too anterior, too far, they can irritate the anterior interosseous nerve. So if that happens, pull the 
you know, what you do is um, withdraw the wire five millimeters prior to bending them. And then when you impact them back in, uh, they won't protrude uh, too far through the anterior cortex. If you go to radial, like we just showed, you can interfere with the proximal radial ulnar joint. So the solution is start more radial and aim a little bit more ulnarly. So an intramedullary screw is also an option. This is very popular um, at some centers. Uh, you will still need to add a tension band wire around that um, washer. Uh, you need typically a pretty long screw, 85 to 110 millimeters, usually 6.5 millimeter cancellous for most patients. Um, there is some risk of shortening if you have osteopenic bone, oblique fractures, and comminution if you're doing any kind of tension banding technique. Uh, and sometimes, you know, because of the shape of the proximal ulna as shown uh, earlier, if you're not careful, you can get a malreduction. So remember, the anatomy of the proximal ulna, you have that uh, 12 degrees of angulation. So when you're uh, using a long screw, beware of that varus bow because it can cause a medial shift of the tip of the olecranon if uh, a long screw is used. So, um, you know, ideal is center, center, start the point on the tip of the olecranon, and you should, in most cases, be able to avoid that complication. So let's pause here. Uh, in the next video, we're going to talk more about when you need to consider plate fixation of olecranon fractures. Thanks.